The Drinks Adventures podcast is proudly supported by our friends at Bintani, Australia's leading supplier of ingredients for the brewing and distilling industries. Bintani has all the ingredients you need and they have experts in all categories on the team, so they understand how ingredients work together like no other supplier. Bintani handpicks the best. I'm James Atkinson, and this is Drinks Adventures, the podcast where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and explore trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Thanks for joining me again on the show, and welcome in particular to all our new listeners. And there must be a few of you because Drinks Adventures has been number one on the Australian iTunes food podcast chart for most of the last week which is obviously very pleasing. So thank you all very much for tuning in. In this episode, I'm chatting with Kathleen Davies, who in 2014 founded Nip of Courage, the first distributor ever to represent exclusively Australian craft spirits and the country's first spirits distributor that is female-owned. Today, the company represents four distilleries, Belgrove in Tasmania, Stone Pine in New South Wales, and two more distilleries in Victoria, Reed & Co. and Timboon Railway Shed Distillery. Kathleen also founded and distributes the Australian Tipple Company range of bottled cocktails, which includes a Negroni, a dry martini, and an espresso martini, all made exclusively with ingredients sourced from Australian artisan producers. So as long as you're listening at an appropriate time, settle in with a nip of a fine Australian spirit and enjoy this chat with Kathleen, just after this message from another one of our valued sponsors. This episode of Drinks Adventures is proudly sponsored by Fever Tree Premium Mixers. Fever Tree pioneered the world's first premium tonic water, made only with naturally sourced ingredients, and today it's served in 9 out of 10 of the world's top restaurants. Fever Tree Tonic, because if three quarters of your G&T is tonic, make sure you mix with the best. Well, Kathleen Davies, thanks so much for joining me on the Drinks Adventures podcast. Thanks for having me, James. So Nip of Courage just celebrated its fifth birthday, didn't it? We sure did, James. Yeah, it was a huge milestone for us. Tell me about the last five years. What's that been like for you when you look back at your decision to embark on this Australian craft spirit journey? Was it a good decision to go down that path? Yeah, look, I think it's uh, still a really exciting time to be part of the industry and the the whole emergence of Australian craft spirits. Um, Back when I first started the business, there was only about 40 craft distilleries that were known throughout Australia. Now there's over 180, so it's grown significantly in the last five years. 180, that's actually significantly more than I thought. So, I mean, it must be a rate of, you know, one every couple of weeks at the moment then. Yeah, yeah. And look, there's a, there's a lot more uh, liquor licences waiting to be approved as well and um, wholesale producer licences with more distilleries trying to open as well and get council approval. So, yeah, it's, it's been a sort of mini explosion of, of small distilleries everywhere. And do you think, and this is something that you hear people ask all the time, you're probably sick of being asked this question, but is it sustainable, the number of new distilleries we're seeing on the market? Yeah, I I think so. What a lot of people don't realise is that Australians, in terms of volume, drink less than 1% of Australian-made, Australian-owned craft spirits. The rest of what we drink here in Australia is actually imported or foreign-owned. So I think there's definitely more market share for Australian producers to gain in the next few years. But I do believe that business acumen is key and and marketing is also key to, to reaching out to the Australian market and the Australian drinkers. Tell us about the portfolio of brands that you've got currently. Has that changed much since you launched early on? Yeah, it has actually. Um, So we manage in our portfolio about 40 different lines. Uh, We're currently working with five distilleries plus our own brand, uh, which is the Aussie Tipple Company, which actually promotes brands within our portfolio and other Australian producers, a bottle cocktail company. In the early days, we had as many as 12 craft distilleries in our portfolio. Obviously back then they had less lines um, per distillery, but it was still really, really difficult to manage that amount of producers. What we have now is quite manageable. We're focusing on growing their businesses because market share is really important right now in Australia and trying to gain volume for, for the brands that we're currently working with. I think 
What's really made it challenging at the moment is if you look at the alcohol market and break it down into different channels, there's probably about 30 different channels that we can work with. And when I say channels, everything from duty free to cruise ships to small bars to retail bottle shops, all these little channels that we can be working with. At the moment, the Australian market or the Australian craft distilleries are all fighting for maybe only four or five of those channels where we could be sort of aiming for the whole 30 to grow our market share. So that will come in time, I think, in the next few years. And that will also help us gain better market share, I think, as well against overseas players. What are some of the other challenges of running a spirits distribution business in Australia? Managing just Australian producers is extremely high maintenance. A lot of the guys that I'm working with are startups and a few of them haven't been involved in the liquor industry before. If you look at my colleagues in the industry that have distribution businesses, they're working with overseas principals or overseas brands, which have more experience in the industry and have worked with other markets before and generally understand distributor supplier relationships and they might only step into the Australian market once a year to to see how their business is going in Australia. Whereas with the business model that I've got, because they're all local, they're constantly in the Australian market looking at their brand And yeah, sometimes that side of things, we we might get a distiller saying, oh, my mate was up in Timbuktu and he was in the pub there and, you know, our product wasn't in the bar. You know, what are you going to do about it, Kathleen? It's sort of like, yeah, okay. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, the overseas guys don't really get that with their overseas principles, but we do with, with local producers. I am trying to help the industry as much as I can by sort of helping with sharing of information on how the industry works to help these new distilleries starting up in Australia so that they can make themselves more attractive to local distributors here as well. Have you noticed a you know, an increased appetite for Australian craft spirits among the customers that you're dealing with? Yes, and I am finding that people are becoming more focused around supporting maybe distilleries that are closer to them as well, which didn't happen in the beginning. I started in my hometown, Sydney. I pretty much started pounding the pavement for two months and did not get a single sale. It was really discouraging. And I remember coming home one night to my husband and just saying, what the hell am I doing? I'd pretty much turn up at bars and say, I've got these products and they'd say, what brands are they? They'd turn around and say, never heard of them before and pretty much bugger off. (laughs) In Melbourne, people would say, What products have you got? What brands? When you told them what the brands were, they'd pretty much say, never heard of them. Get your butt in here and show them to me. So it was a different sort of mindset in Melbourne. And and looking back, I think that attitudes come from, in Sydney, a lot of the head offices of the big global companies are based here. They tend to have a lot of influence around the Sydney market in general with, with bars. And so that was a huge thing for me starting out. What inspired you to launch the business and what's your background in the drinks industry? Yeah, so I've been in the liquor industry now for just over 26 years. I've worked for a lot of big corporates and blue chip companies, you know, Carlton and United Breweries, Lion Nathan, all all the big companies, Coca-Cola, Amatil. I think um, it got to a certain point where my, my opportunities were limited and I was looking at a bit of a glass ceiling in my career. So I ended up going back to working with small businesses because I was passionate about that and the opportunity came up to start this. And I thought it would be really easy. I was in uh, export at the time and saw that the craft beer boom had already taken off years ago in the US and the UK and what the next trend that was happening was craft spirits and I thought who is sort of championing that in Australia in terms of distribution and there wasn't anyone at the time that I could see that had a focus on it and when I started drilling down into researching what was going on I realised that most of these distilleries were based in rural or remote areas and that's why a lot of people didn't even know they existed and I rang up a few in the early days and sort of said, oh, I'd love to represent you. This is my business plan. Would you be interested? And they just sort of basically said, no, you know, you're about 
the tenth or twentieth person that's asked us that and let us down, and you know we're we're not really interested. So I realised at that point for them to take me seriously, I've got to go out in person and see these people, touch the flesh, and show them my conviction and what I want to do and why I'm passionate about this. My grandfather told me years ago that you should look a person in the eye, shake their hand, and and do business that way, and it's almost like going back to the old days of doing business and a handshake agreement. It's all how it sort of started rather than doing things electronically or over the phone. So I uh, packed my bags and pretty much went around Australia and rounded up all of the distilleries that I wanted to work with and knew about at the time. The other thing that I really had to do was differentiate myself from other distributors. And I looked at what the weaknesses and opportunities, strengths and threats were with these small businesses in the middle of nowhere and thought, well, what can I bring to their business that's a little bit different? And I decided that I would use some of the things that I'd learnt in corporate life and, and try to help them with their business by doing marketing plans and um, help them with their business plan to get more people through the door of their cellar doors and almost have turned my business into a brand itself by doing that. So it has helped open a lot of doors with different customers, just having Nip of Courage as, as a brand for Australian producers. and. I don't just promote my own guys that I look after. I try to promote the industry. I keep a directory on my website page and things like that as well to try and help people find where distilleries are around Australia. I'm sure that the climate is vastly different now for Nip of Courage. When early on you had to make cold calls, yeah. I bet the shoe's on the other foot now and you're getting a lot of approaches. Are you looking to build the portfolio? And if so, I mean, what are the real things that are crucial for you in considering whether you would take on a brand? I've had a lot of distilleries come and go. We haven't seen eye to eye and that's just life and that's business. And we're all small business owners working together, so it's not always going to be the perfect fit. But, you know, we do get approached a lot now. And what we do look for are people that are willing to receive feedback is a really big thing. We're definitely not the biggest distributor in the marketplace and we've got a long way to go and grow. So we need people that are understanding of that. We also need people that make spirits in an authentic way. Uh, that's good quality and got a good story behind them as well. And as stupid as it sounds, we need to get on. When the distillers come to Sydney, they come and stay at my house. Um, my husband and I don't have any children, but we've got lots of bedrooms. <laughs> Instead of the pitter patter of children running around the house, we have the pitter patter of distillers <laughs> when they come. So <laughs> probably a bit of a heavier sound than pitter patter, yeah. I imagine. <laughs> Especially after a few drinks. <laughs> but yeah, so um, we do that so that we can help each other's businesses and. Generally, when I go out to the regions and visit my distillers, you know, I'll crash on their lounge or their spare bed or whatever to save a bit of money as well because it is expensive when we all travel around Australia. One of the biggest challenges for distribution in general across Australia for any business, big or small, is just the cost of transport and logistics. So Australia being such a big landmass with small population, it's, it's a huge challenge in every business. Now, you said before that there are 180 distilleries in Australia. There's probably a lot of other brands that um, are being made that people might think are distilleries yeah. but are actually contract distilled. You've been fairly outspoken, I think, about the importance of distinguishing these brands that really are distillery brands from yeah. these contract um, brands. Maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, and look, there is nothing wrong in my view of, of contract distilled brands, but they shouldn't be claiming that they're distilleries in my view. To actually have a distillery operation, there's a huge amount of overheads and expenses involved. A lot of the distilleries that we work with, they have got their house on the line to fund their cellar doors, their distilleries in general, and and just the upkeep. You know, uh, contract distilled brands don't have the distillery upkeep or overheads, so there is a distinct difference. That's why on our website we just list, well, a distillery is a distillery and a cellar door is a cellar door, so that's why we've only listed those specific ones on our website, independent bottlers and 
contract distilled brands is a very different thing. In fact, my own business, Aussie Tipple, is a contract distilled brand. You'll see that that is not on the directory of distilleries either. So, yeah, it's just important that people understand the difference as well. That's why sometimes you might see contract distilled brands being a little bit cheaper because they don't have those overheads that the distilleries have. And you've chosen only to work with the, the brands that have that authenticity of, of having a distillery and having a, a cellar door that people can visit, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We look at the following things, exactly having their own cellar door that we can help promote, having their own still, even growing their own ingredients as well is important, having a really good story, having good quality, products and having a brand that we can help develop is is really important and what I look for. There's been a lot of media attention given to the gin boom which yes. is gin a big part of what Nip of Courage does? Yeah it is. There's a great thing happening with gin in Australia and in Australia I think there's 22,000 or 24,000 native botanicals available that we have that don't grow anywhere else in the world. Our gin distillers in Australia having access to these native botanicals is really great because it gives a point of difference in the overseas market as well. If we try and make a London dry with traditional London dry botanicals, it's very difficult to compete with global brands that are already in the marketplace providing those products at a really good quality at a lesser price because they're made on scale. So for Australian producers, it's you know, a no-brainer to use elements of native botanicals in their gins. Gin in general is one of the fastest growing white spirit categories in the premium segment in the world. There's obviously been probably just as much attention on Australian whiskey. The problem is no one can afford to buy it. <laughs> yeah, look, and I think you'll see that change in the very near future because there's more producers producing whiskey in Australia and also some really good quantities are being produced by distilleries as well. So I think at the moment there's in terms of craft, there's large scale distilleries like Lime Burners, Starwood, Archie Rose who are yet to release their whiskey but do have large quantities coming. And then, you know, you look at micro distilleries which have, you know, significantly less in volume which are attracting higher prices. I think you'll start to see in the next few years people starting to fill in the middle gap in terms of volume and we'll start to see more competitive pricing coming through. I think it's going to be a challenge in the future for really small distilleries that are doing one-off single batch releases and single barrel releases. I think that we've already seen a bit of a heyday with that type of product being released. I think for distilleries, they need to evolve a little bit and almost have like a flagship whiskey, more or less, that is you know, available ongoing. Similar to what Star would have done, I think what they've done is really smart having a flagship whiskey, but also then just having experimental releases coming out, I think has been a really good uh, marketing idea to, to get their brand out there. Not everyone can be like Sullivan's Cove. No, no, Sullivan's Cove have, and, and that's uh, great that you've brought that up. Sullivan's Cove have been really important to the whiskey industry in Australia, especially when they won the global award. I think it was 2014. You know, it really put Australia on the map and also opened up the eyes to consumers in Australia to start looking at Australian whiskey as well. So, yeah, I think if you ask most Australians if they know of any Australian whiskies, highly likely one of the three they'll mention is Sullivan's Cove, Lark or Starwood even. So, yeah. Let's talk about rum. That's the yes. um, category that's been more linked with Australian history than anything else. Exactly, um, yeah. Uh, are, are you working with any producers of rum and are you seeing any um, change in consumer attitude to rum? Yeah, look, rum is a really undervalued category, I think, uh, in terms of premium rum in Australia. There are some fantastic producers out there doing some really fantastic things with rum. If you look at the East Coast, for example, we've got players like Husk, up in northern New South Wales that are doing paddock to bottle fresh pressed cane juice rum. There's Bricks Distillery, which has just opened in Sydney, which is working on large scale rum. There's also Stone Pine Distillery, who's one of our producers that we look after. He was doing some beautiful single barrel releases, 
but it just didn't take off. So what he ended up doing was looking at another category within rum that's really taking off globally, which is spice rum. So he launched a beautiful line called Dead Man's Drop, Australia's first Australian-made, Australian-owned black spice rum, and it's been spiced with native botanicals, and it's a Solera-style base rum. It's been very successful for us and has been also a good introduction to people that are interested in trying Australian rum. There's still a little bit of a stigma out there with the big white polar bear that is out there spruiking Australian rum. Consumers are sort of scared off by Australian rum because of that. I know that they're making changes in their own business to change that perception as well. So I think in the next few years, watch this space with Australian rum. There's also big producers like Archie Rose looking at getting into the rum category as well. There's also some guys on the West Coast doing great things with rum. Obviously Hoochery up in uh, Kununurra in northern WA and and also um, uh, some other rum producers as well on the west coast starting to emerge into the market. So there's some really, really exciting things happening with rum. If you go back to the old world and the really established spirits brands, um, most of them, or if not all of them, are focused on doing one thing. How hard do you think it is for some of these brands that are really having a, a bet each way on, you know, gin, vodka, whiskey, rum. Is that a sort of a positive thing for, for you when you're working with these brands or does that make your job more difficult? Uh, yes and no. It just depends how well they do different things. I think in the case of Stone Pine, they have a really strong gin range. It has a lot of diversity. There's some beautiful styles. It's been really well made. But Ian also makes a line of vodka and also rum. For me, I don't see an issue with that. And then on the other hand, if you look at someone like Kangaroo Island Spirits, a lot of people don't know this, but they were actually one of the first dedicated gin distilleries in Australia about 14 years ago, uh, run by John and Sarah Lark. So John Lark is actually Bill Lark's brother. I think some distilleries get a little bit wishy-washy, by having too many different categories. I do believe you need to focus on one particular category and then maybe have one or two secondary lines. But in Australia, with things that are aged like rum, brandy and whiskey, you've got to wait a minimum of two years for the product to mature in wood. And so that can be challenging when you don't have any money coming in. And I think that's why a few distilleries have gone off and made other products to help I guess, fund that little gap and waiting time. And that's pretty much, I think, how Archie Rose set up their business as well. They're wanting to make sure that they've got enough supply of whiskey for when they do release. And they've become accidental <laughs> gin distillery as well, just by, you know, providing a really nice quality gin in the process of waiting for, for their whiskey to come along. I don't see anything wrong with that. And distilleries really need to be a little bit diverse. And there's also some really good cellar door experiences out there as well, which are really important. And by having those different categories within their portfolios that they produce does help with tourism and, and people visiting their distilleries for the first time, so yeah. What do you see as the biggest challenges for the sector moving forward? I think awareness with the general public, because a lot of these startup distilleries don't really have the marketing or the dollars to reach out to the general public. There's a lot of groundwork that they've got to do to, to make themselves known. And as I said a little bit earlier, I think business acumen is really important too, that they keep on top of trends and also um, making sure that their marketing and look and feel of, of the product is appealing to the general population. I think gone are the days where you just produce a, a product and people appreciate just the spirit itself and you know, look past how crappy the bottle and the label are. I think nowadays with more and more producers coming on board, local distilleries in Australia really need to be business savvy. They need good quality spirit, good packaging, good marketing and good distribution as well. Well, look, we might leave it there. Thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, James. 
Now, if you weren't keeping an eye on the James Atkinson Drinks Adventures Facebook page, you would have missed the Stone and Wood giveaway we ran at the beginning of Season 2. Congratulations to Sean Eagles, who correctly answered the question and won a case of Stone and Wood's new Sticky Nectar Hazy Mango IPA. This week we have another great giveaway, thanks to Nip of Courage, which has offered Drinks Adventures listeners a 15% discount on purchases from the Nip of Courage website. Simply enter the special code at checkout, Drinks Adventures 15, all one word, all uppercase, and not only will you receive the discount, but you'll go into the draw to win a bottle of limited edition rhubarb gin from Stone Pine Distillery in Bathurst, New South Wales. This offer and the competition closes on Wednesday, June 13, 2019. And a reminder that in Australia, it is against the law to sell or supply alcohol to or to obtain alcohol on behalf of a person under the age of 18 years. Thank you to a person who goes under the moniker of Chip Flavours, who wrote a great review of the program on iTunes. He or she says, James, blown away by your professional presentation style on your latest episode about Stone and Wood. Rather than the traditional question and answer format, you interspersed audio from multiple sources and told a very engaging story. Keep up the awesome work, mate. I'll be listening. And a reminder, folks, that these reviews don't write themselves. Please take a moment to give Drinks Adventures a rating and a few words of feedback on iTunes or Stitcher. It is very much appreciated. Thanks for your company on the show. I'll see you again soon. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.